Hello Game Changers. Welcome to Epics of Honor. What if we could tell you everything? The entire history of the world. Now, what if we told you we could do it in just two hours? We're going to tell the whole story. From the Big Bang to the present day. How the planet prepared for the rise of man. How the Stone Age led to the steam engine. How the first seeds sprouted into cities and civilizations. Everything is connected and the path leads to you. It took history 13.7 billion years to unfold. We'll show you everything you need to know in the next two hours. In these first cities, crops are king. To keep track of them, our ancestors developed the first writing. To protect them, the first armies. And to administer them, the beginnings of politics. When you have hundreds or thousands of people who are living together, there's simply too many people to sort of run around and, and create a census. It creates a need for government. It creates a need for some form of social and political hierarchy. Planting seeds has set man on a new path. Settlements have grown into cities. But to take the next epic step from city to civilization, we'll need the help of a very surprising creature. Five thousand years ago, after wandering the earth for more than a hundred thousand years, mankind has begun to settle down. We cluster near rivers, along the Tigris and Euphrates, the Nile, the Indus, the Yellow and Yangtze. Civilizations are about to take off. But first, they must all master one thing, trade. The more they exchange goods and learn from other lands, the faster they grow. It seems that long distance trade and communication is a necessary precursor to allow urban civilization as we know it. And surprisingly, the first civilizations arise on the back of a creature with a lowly reputation in the modern world, the donkey. The donkey caravan is the interstate highway and high-speed internet of its day. Their roots will lay the groundwork for the modern world. Moving not only goods like timber and bronze, but ideas and stories. The civilizations they connect will be some of the first described in the Bible. The caravan routes converge at the Persian Gulf where they link up with ships that carry goods to India. It essentially brought these civilizations together into great cultural and material exchange and really was the beginning of the trend towards globalization. It is a key to understanding how our world works to this day. Just like the first civilizations, we trade and form networks. These networks form hubs. And throughout history, being at that hub has meant one thing. The amount of ideas, the amount of cargo that passes through a region seems to have a direct correlation to how powerful and important they are. By 2000 BC, humans have gone from humble huts to massive monuments. In Africa, great pyramids arise on the banks of the Nile. The first stages of Stonehenge rise up in ancient Britain. And back in Samaria, artificial temple mounds called ziggurats 
climb ever higher toward the heavens. To cement these massive structures together, the builders of Samaria turn to a substance that oozes from seepages along the Euphrates River. It's called bitumen. Used as asphalt in the modern world, it is the first petroleum product to be exploited by mankind. While bitumen is highly prized, the lighter, thinner substance oozing from the ground along with it is considered a nuisance by the ancients because it catches fire so easily. The ancients call it naphtha. We call it gasoline. And it's one of the first indications of the vast oil fields that will one day turn the cradle of civilization into a center of wealth and warfare. The legacy of these first civilizations can be seen in surprising ways. The Sumerian counting system was based on the number 12 rather than 10, which is why we divide our days into two 12-hour blocks, our hours into 60 minutes, and our minutes into 60 seconds. The Sumerians also likely invented the wheel, which eventually leads to another innovation that will change the course of man, the chariot. Thus bringing together the Sumerian invention of the wheel right, with the, the domestication of the horse that had occurred amongst these nomadic peoples into this um, really formidable piece of military technology. Around 1200 BC, a chariot-driven clash of civilizations cuts off trade routes for copper and tin, the metals we need to make bronze tools and weapons. But luckily, the stars have made us an alternative. Iron. Now, metalsmiths make a crucial discovery. By working at higher temperatures, they can release the power of this ancient metal. Easier to sharpen and 700 times more common on Earth than copper. It is a game changer. Humanity enters the Iron Age. As we reach the first millennium BC, history has taken us on a wild ride. From the initial blast of the Big Bang, to the formation of Earth and its first creatures, and the rise of man. We've seen the Ice Age create bridges to spread mankind around the world, then strand us on different continents, leaving us to survive on what we have at hand. So by 1000 BC, the world remains a divided place. The trade network that connects much of Eurasia and North Africa doesn't yet penetrate the planet's driest deserts or cross the vastest oceans. Cut off by geography are people in places like Sub-Saharan Africa and the Americas. With few easy to domesticate plants and animals of their own, they remain tied to more ancient ways of life. Six hundred BC. The cavalry have arrived. Humans ride into battle on horseback for the first time. We've seen that just taming a horse gives man a massive advantage. Now, pairing him with iron weapons makes him nearly unstoppable. These advances in technology, they don't just make a fighting ability possible. They make empires possible. And that is the story of the next several millennia. With new technology and improved logistics, empires spread, uniting massive land areas under a central control. As empires grow, so do new beliefs. One interesting phenomenon we see with the rise of these empires is this idea of monotheism. This idea of a universal God that develops over time. And it's just a phenomenon. Judaism emerges, from which we eventually get Christianity, 
and Islam. Buddhism and Hinduism also arise. The five major religions today are all rooted in this remarkable era. Although empires spread, some great powers remain isolated. The rise of the Himalayas 50 million years earlier has left China cut off from trading with the rest of the world. But that is about to change. Around 100 BC, a Chinese emperor sends an envoy to the west in search of alliances. The routes he travels will become the Silk Roads. A massive trade network that connects China across Central Asia to the Roman Empire. China has joined the world. As far as we know, no Chinese trader ever met a Roman. No Roman ever met a Chinese trader, at least during this first period of the Silk Roads. But this vast trade then began to explode. Between about 100 BC and about 200 AD, we have three centuries of trade and cultural exchange on a level that has not been seen before in human history. But this new human network also unleashes hidden dangers. By the beginning of the Common Era, great empires have risen and a massive trading network connects most of Europe and Asia. But the trade routes also carry an invisible threat. Disease. Massive epidemics that some blame for taking down both the Roman Empire and China's Han Dynasty. But these networks also lead to the spread of religion. In 312 AD, the Roman Emperor Constantine converts to Christianity, paving the way for it to become the dominant religion of Europe and the West. Three centuries later, Islam also emerges. A religion that will, for a time, unify a territory two and a half times larger than Rome ever was. Arab trade will drive innovation for the next thousand years and expand the global network to places it has never gone before. The Arabs are sitting in the middle of Afro-Eurasia. There are Arab traders who are sailing off to China. There are Arab traders who are traveling all the way to the Atlantic Ocean. So they are sitting in the middle of the hub. One secret to Arab trade, the camel. A creature whose ancestor, like the horse, escaped across the Bering Land Bridge out of North America. A caravan of six camels can lug as much as two tons of cargo as far as 60 miles a day. Twice the load of a donkey caravan in half the time. For the first time, Camel caravans open up reliable trade routes across the formidable Sahara Desert, leading to the formation of the first states in West Africa. Arabic trade expands, moving salt from the Sahara to Rome, rice from Eastern Asia to India, the secrets of making paper out of China into Europe, and countless other inventions and ideas around the world. Where does our word for lemon come from? Where does our word for coffee come from? They're all Arabic. Because the Arabs brought a huge number of food crops into Europe. Oranges, citrus crops, they come from South China. Yet they don't make it to the West until the great age of the Arabs. In Islamic North Africa, one Italian merchant named Leonardo Fibonacci becomes well-schooled in the ways of Arab traders. He picks up on a simple but ingenious counting system that originated in India but is used extensively in the Arab world. His writings will spread this knowledge to Europe 
and around the globe. With everyone counting the same way, business and trade will explode. And because of Fibonacci, people today still almost universally use the numbers known as Arabic numerals. But there is another idea Arab traders will spread, something even more influential. It originates in China around 800 AD. A Chinese alchemist in search of an elixir for long life instead stumbles upon chemistry that can bring sudden death. He combines carbon and sulfur with saltpeter, a compound made of potassium, nitrogen and oxygen. Forged in the stars, these elements now come together to make gunpowder. The recipe for gunpowder eventually moves west across the Silk Roads to the Islamic world, where Muslim warriors use it to fire cannonballs at Christian crusaders. Europeans pick up on the idea, embracing and perfecting gunpowder weapons. In 1992 AD, there are roughly 400 million people in the world, but it is still divided in two. In the Americas, the civilizations of the Aztecs, Mayans, and Incas have all arisen. While halfway around the world, in the aftermath of the fall of Rome, Europe has cracked like an egg into individual states. For Italian-born Christopher Columbus, this means he can appeal for funding from a succession of European rulers. Until he finally convinces the king and queen of Spain to back his expeditions. It has taken all of Earth's history to make Columbus's journey possible. For tacking into the wind, he uses triangular sails, a technology copied from the Arabs. To guide him, the compass, an invention from China. And guiding the needle, a magnetic field formed with the core of the planet itself. Although Columbus is looking for a new way to sail to India, what he does instead is finally and forever connect the two halves of the world. The voyage is not just significant in American history. As you'll see, it's a pivotal event in all of human history. Nothing will ever be the same. The end of the Ice Age marooned large pockets of humanity on separate sides of the globe for over 15,000 years. Now, that's all about to change. The voyage of Christopher Columbus in 1492 is taught as one of the most significant events in American history. In fact, it's one of the most significant events in all of human history. Prior to that voyage, the great world zones had existed largely in isolation. By crossing the Atlantic, Columbus opens up the vast American world zone, these two enormous continents of North and South America, with the millions of people that are living there, the resources that are available, and for the first time, people living in Eurasia become aware of this other part of the world. Until the voyage of Columbus, these people may as well have been living on different planets, so isolated were they. A trade network that started with the first civilizations, connected Europe, Asia and Africa, now reaches across the Atlantic. In this vast new global network, new hubs will form. And once again, power will shift. For most of the last 2,000 years, Europe hasn't been that important. Then we get the age of Columbus, and what do you know? This is exactly the time where we see the rise of the West. This is when the West starts taking over, when it gets itself smack bang in the middle of the biggest exchange network the world has ever seen. 
Now, foods that had been isolated on disconnected continents begin to move around the world. Maize from the Americas shows up in Egypt and China. Potatoes from the Andes prove perfectly suited to the soils of Ireland and Russia. The old fertile crescent grains, like wheat, begin to feed the Americas. New foods mean more calories, more energy. Within three centuries of Columbus's voyage, the population of the world will more than double to 900 million. But the unequal hands dealt to the two hemispheres now play out in a deadly climax. European conquistadors, inheritors of the agriculture and animals of the Fertile Crescent, and the trade spread along the vast networks of the Old World, come bearing guns, riding horses, and carrying infectious diseases. The result, slaughter. In the years following Columbus's first voyage, 95% of the native population in the Americas will die from European guns and germs. Once the hemispheres are connected, nothing can ever be the same. Take the incredible story of sugar. Chemically, it's the only source of fuel for our brains, a substance we are programmed to crave. Raw sugar comes mostly from sugar cane. Once again, a grass will play a central role in the story of mankind. First cultivated more than 6,000 years ago in Asia, Europeans discovered sugar in the Middle East during the Crusades and carried it home. Europe was hooked. But there's virtually nowhere in Europe where sugar can grow. Then we have Christopher Columbus and the discovery of the New World. And the Spanish conquistadors, yes, they f initially are very interested in the gold and the silver, but really, they just want to make it rich. They don't care how they're going to make it rich. And once the gold and the silver has been looted, the next step is to open sugar plantations. The Spanish themselves don't want to work in the sugar plantations. They start looking around for a new labor force. And over on the other side of the Atlantic, there is a place where they can buy slaves. And if we look at the history of slavery, the number one destination of slaves from Africa, a sugar plant. Future of AI technology changing rapidly. The world is fast evolving, with artificial intelligence, AI, at the forefront in changing the world and the way we live. Some of people says AI can take the world and destroy human. If you want to know about how AI can change the world watch this video. Like, comment and share the video and also subscribe now. Thank you.